Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Temenos this morning. It's it's an honor for me to be here uh, with you this morning, on this cool, brisk morning, mm -hmm. which reminds us that that which flowers in the summertime is getting ready to sleep, and that which arises in the cold is beginning to wake. Uh, we begin this morning with our song, Spirit of Life. <laughs> with no one there, the full potential of a love affair, everything waits to be noticed. Twenty-eight geese in sudden flight, the last star on the edge of the night, a single button come undone, the middle child, the prodigal son, everything waits to be noticed. A trickle underneath a dam, the missing line from a telegram, the whispering pains that say you are living, the slow burn of not forgiving, the quiet room, the unlikely pair, everything waits to be noticed. Longing for braver days, cautiously turning a phrase, going unnoticed, but everything waits to be noticed. Oh, your 
chosen few, then I am not one of them. If an elect, well, I have not been elected. I am one who is knocking at the door. I am one whose foot is on the bottom rung. But I know that heaven's bottom rung is heaven, though the latter is standing on the earth where I work by day and sleep by night with my head upon the stone. It's the reading. said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And Jesus said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they replied, Oh, we're able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, 
You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here ends the reading. Now, I want to explain the previous readings of the poems. Um, today is, a, is the season of Pentecost, or of ordinary time. It is the time in the church year for uh, learning and listening and, and the teachings uh, of that scripture has to offer. Today's scripture is a unique one. It's uh, kind of dropped in the middle of the, the 10th chapter of Mark, and uh, it needs a little explaining, but it, it fits in with what's happening because we're about two-thirds of the way through the Gospel of Mark, this reading appears. And in this story, Jesus has fed thousands, he has done all kinds of healings, he has gathered lots of followers. And so the disciples are thinking this has got some real movement. Now, is a, is a kind of a historical piece, during this occupation period for Israel, there were a lot of messiahs who came uh, up to claim to be the one that was going to free Israel from its, its uh, persecution. Most of them ran their followers into the teeth of the Roman army and they were slaughtered. And uh, that is uh, significant in two ways, because it's going to in, under, in influence how we see this passage, but it also I'm going to step right outside of everything and give you a little random piece of information that you probably don't need to know and probably never thought about. Has it ever occurred to you in the Garden of Gethsemane reading that all of a sudden the disciples showed up with a sword? Hmm. And, you know, in one story cut one of the someone's ear off, and Jesus had to heal it, and the other one, Jesus said, put the sword away. I never figured the disciples to be sword-carrying people, right? That was just not kind of my image of them. So it was always odd to me that at the Garden of Gethsemane, all of a sudden, there are swords there. Now, traditional understanding is, oh, they were afraid of the Roman guard. Well, yes, but why would they be afraid of the Roman guard? And the answer is, is that most of the messiahs that came before them all ran their disciples right into the Roman guard because the thinking of the Messiah was it was someone who was going to restore Israel to its greatness. And as Israel understood that meaning to be the great power that they were like under King David and the kings. And so certainly that would be the overthrow of the Roman government who was occupying them, and then Israel would be restored. So in that context, in that understanding of what the expectations of the people were at that time, we have James and John, uh, James and uh, yeah, James and John showing up to Jesus and saying, "We want to be your right hand and your left hand people." And Jesus kind of, I, I mean, I see a sarcastic Jesus here, but I am from Minnesota, so I see kind of sarcasm in a lot of places. Um, I see Jesus saying, "Really? You think so? Uh, what is it that you think you're going to get here? You know? And can you do what I've done? Can you can you be?" born with the baptism that I am? Do you have the call that I have? Oh, yeah, sure, yeah, we do know what we can do in Jesus. Yeah, we're there for you. Um, because they would have thought that what was going to happen as the crowds were swelling, as we approached the final third of uh, Jesus' journey in the Gospel of Mark, that this was the time that Jesus was going to mount the energy to rise it up, to bring it into uh, righteous conflict with the Romans and overthrow the Romans. He's already stumped the Pharisees. I mean, he's already bamboozled their teachings and, and called them hypocrites for not following their own laws, right? And so this, he's, he's got it. He's got it going on. And so this is what they're thinking, is that this is what's going to happen. Uh, so I believe they were thinking. And so they show up to Jesus and they say, this is who we want to be, your right hand man. And Jesus says, you think you can do it? And they said, yes. And Jesus says, okay, maybe you can. But you're not going to be my right-hand man and my left-hand man. That's not for me to assign. So here's the questions that come out of that first paragraph of that text. 
why do they want this? There are 12 apostles there, disciples, and two of them show up and say, we want to be the head. We want to be number one and number two. Why? Isn't being one of 12 enough? Do you need to be more important than the other 10? Haven't you gotten enough attention as one of the 12? Do you, do you, do you really need to say, yeah, I need, I'm the number one. Yep, 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 that's me. I'm the number one disciple. <clears throat> Why do they need to be noticed that way? What is that thing that says in them, don't you see me, Jesus? I'm over here. I'm, I'm, I'm the right-hand man. Every, everything waits to be noticed, says the lyric from the song. That's why I chose that reading. Because it occurred to me that that is a fundamental human need. I want to be noticed. Now, studies have shown that children who aren't noticed and children who are ignored and uh, grow up and it, it has dam does damage them. So we really are social creative beings that need to be noticed. People, we need people to see us. Uh, we need people to interact with us. We're terribly susceptible to people saying judgmental things about us. Right? We have this, this social need. And if someone says, I really don't like your tie, Robin. I have no idea why you're wearing plaid. <laughs> I mean, it's truly plaid. It's definitely coming to February. I can't believe that you're wearing plaid. You know, I, oh, you know, the shame of, 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 you know, wearing the wrong thing at the wrong time. God forbid you should wear white when it's not the white season. And I don't even know what the white season is. Um, and so we have to recognize that that we have this, this need to be noticed. We, we need to be seen by others, that we're community people. And this is a part of who we are. The flip side of that is, is we have to understand that about ourselves so that when things come up like judgment over plaid ties, um, we have some sense of why we're reacting the way we are to that, right? I mean, we see young children, high school, middle school kids responding to judgment that they see on a computer screen uh, and is with terrible reactions, emotionally difficult. Um, instead of just seeing that as, as words on a screen, somehow our social being part of us internalizes this and, and we take it to heart and we have all these feelings around this, right? That's completely normal. This is who we are. Understanding that sometimes helps us to manage that. But nonetheless, we have this need to be noticed. But they're doing more than just being noticed here, right? I mean, they're asking for status. So what's that about? I mean, what's the real question that they're asking? I see it as power. That Jesus, you know, we're one of 12. And you've seen the Motley 12. Peter can't do anything right. The rest of them are just bumbling around. You keep talking with Judas over there. And we think we need to step up here and take control. Because that's what power is, right? Power is control. Power is the, the uh, authority that's looked up to. Power is the authority that makes the decision. And power, and uh, so recognition, with recognition, comes power and control, which is the only way I can understand celebrity power and control in our world. So the, the text comes to us today and has two people coming to Jesus and asking, to be recognized as the people who take control. And Jesus says to them, you sure? You think you can do that? Oh, yep, yep, we can. And Jesus says, well, maybe you can do what I'm to do, but I, I can't give you the, the right and left hand. And so the text continues and the 12 heard this, and of course, what was their reaction? Oh, yeah, and they put them right up there. Yeah, you just go right ahead. <laughs> no, no, that's not what this is about. We have a whole series of stories of, of, of disciples following Jesus and kind of not getting it. But I don't think they were upset because they didn't think James and John were not getting it. 
I think they were upset because James and John wanted to take control and wanted power. And they had agreed to follow Jesus, not James and John. And he says, so when they heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So then Jesus calls them all together, right? One kid acts up and the whole class has to be punished. <laughs> you know that among the Gentiles, they recognize their rulers. They have rulers. And those rulers lord it over you. And above the rulers, you have the great ones. And the great ones are tyrants over the lords and the rulers. And then you. He said, but it not, won't be amongst you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be a servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give life to uh, his to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, the interpretation of the word is slave in that language has caused angst in our American society and in the, the world for how human beings have had slaves. At this time, the slave was absolutely a slave, subservient, but it wasn't meant for people to become literal slaves of people, but just that you were at that low position with on the totem pole, right? If you want to be the greatest, you've got to be the least. And so Jesus addresses the power structure of what God's call for us to be. Now there's another way to interpret that. There's a German theologian, Jürgen Moltmann, who when he's talking about the Trinity, Okay, you have the Father, Son, and the Spirit, and three are one, right? Got all that language that makes sense but doesn't make sense. He talks about the word perichoresis. Now, perichoresis is a Greek word which means interdwelling. And Moltmann uses it to describe the Trinity. He says the Trinity is uh, three beings who are so interdwelling within each other that they are really unaware of their own being. We can think of it in terms of love. The lover is always focused on the beloved. The lover doesn't focus on themselves. The lover focuses on the other. Okay, This is how we image God uh, with us. This is how we image uh, Christ on the cross. He's not consumed at all with himself. He's focused all on the other people. What my life is about you. Okay? So this is what Jesus is teaching them, that your life is like God's life in that it is not about you, but it is about them. Um, parents who have children understand that at, at all kinds of different levels, right? You have children, you want to do things, but you can't because they have uh, need attention and care for. So Jesus is saying to his disciples, if you want to follow me, you can't lord it over each other. You can't put one more in charge than the other. No one's got more power than the other. In fact, power doesn't even come into play because you should not even be focused upon what your position is. You should be concerned about the position of the other. Now, we know from history that the disciples got that wrong and that uh, Peter and James decided that everybody should become a Jew in order to become a Christian, and this was a big thing, and Paul was a pain in their their side because he went out to the Gentiles and they weren't sure they really wanted to do that. Long history that they didn't get. Not, not important to the text. But it's a question that comes to us from the text about ourselves. And it's a question about who we are as people and human beings. When we get up in the morning we think about ourselves and we think about our world. Do we think about what are we going to get out of this today? Do we think about it from the, our own terms? Or do we think about our lives in terms of how can I help someone else's life to happen? How can I help someone else's life to be better? Um, I think one of the beautiful things, I think one of the terms that describes life best is beauty. And I think that one of the things that we do with each other that love does is love helps make people beautiful. Okay, um, it's 
why everything waits to be noticed, right? You need somebody to notice you, to love you, to make you feel beautiful. Uh, but we do that for each other. We listen to the beautiful music and we appreciate the gift that is given to us. Right? We look at the people who do work here and make this place possible and we see the beautiful things that they do, even if it's just putting boards on the side of a new building. And we thank them and we appreciate the beauty that they have. Okay? That our lives are about looking at the world and seeing what's beautiful and appreciating and helping people who are stuck who can't be beautiful for one reason or another, who have experienced a trauma, a tragedy, uh, a life in pain. And we, we reach out to them. This is the story of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, going through all of the miracles to heal people, talking to the authorities and saying to them, you can't treat people this way. It's not even according to your own rules and laws that you're supposed to treat people this way. Okay. So the, the question in today's text, it isn't like what you're going to hear in a couple of weeks, a grand ceremony or a grand event in the life of Jesus. This is a text that comes to us and asks us the question that not to answer, but to take time to think about. When we think about ourselves in relationship to God, when we think about ourselves in relationship to each other, how do we think about that? Do we think about it in terms of what can I do to help, to serve, to make you beautiful, to make the world beautiful, to make life beautiful, to help you, to be able to help someone else become beautiful? And I think is, it's a simple question, but I think that's all that the text has for us. Jesus doesn't really answer James and John. He says, okay, you can do it, but I can't give you everything you've asked for. But he doesn't really tell them yes. Um, and then he tells them, you can't lord it over each other. So now, James and John, how are you going to be the people who follow me? Are you going to lord it over people? Or are you going to be a part of the twelve? Uh, and are you going to put yourself in the lowest position in order to be able to serve those? Because uh, if you don't put yourself in the lowest position, you're always going to be above somebody. And you won't be able to serve some people then. You have to put yourself in the lowest position because you need to be able to serve the lowest person. Right? Folks, that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you for your time.
seconds if you want to uh, vocalize that uh, and share that with others or keep that in your heart uh, is up to you. Well, I'd say a prayer for Robin who's having knee surgery tomorrow. Let the surgery be great success so the rehabilitation easy and we won't see him limping anymore. Second that. Mm -hmm. Prayers for my brother Ken uh, with his kidney cancer uh, diagnosis and my husband Jake uh, that his biopsy uh, comes back good. For all who have had their lives changed by traumatic and tragic events. God of creation who breathes the winds of change and rains down renewal upon us with the warm sun of love. Fill us with your presence and open our hearts to your ways that we may trust in the path that you have before us. We are people who sometimes grow quickly and sometimes get stuck in the struggles and pains which life can bring. Free us when we are bound in the ways we don't always understand or recognize, that we may grow to the fullness of our being. God of health and healing, your paths lead us to waters which wash away that which tarnishes us and leads us to fields which nourish our mind, body, and spirit. Foster in us ways of health and healing that we may serve to do the same. We pray as your people who live in grace. May we dance along the path that leads us home. Sing of the healing we have received and rest in the tranquility of love. Continue all this particularly with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Continue with the offer. Thank you. 
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God who teaches all we know. Praise God within among above. Praise God in life with acts of love. Amen. May the God who gives you life, who sees you, and who asks you to be the least, does so in order to let the beauty within you shine and the gifts that you have been given share. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and enjoy the weather.